All right, guys. So thank you so much for joining me. I'm here with the one and only James D. Nicolantonio, the author of the new book, The Salt Fix. I am so ecstatic to uh, have the opportunity to have a conversation with him because, you know, I have a few, uh, as I think most people do, uh, knowledge gaps where, um, you know, there are areas where I just haven't spent a lot of time doing uh, my own research. And one of those areas is uh, sodium and salt intake, and you are the de facto expert. You've written this tremendous book, so I'm really excited to uh, get to have a conversation with you. So, for you know, for one, thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Max. Of course. Um, so, why don't you give me first for people that haven't heard of you or haven't heard of the book? Why don't you just tell me a little bit about uh, your background? Yeah, so I'm Dr. James Dinicol Antonio. I'm a doctor of pharmacy and a cardiovascular research scientist at St. Luke's Mid America Heart Institute. Um, I've published over 200 papers in the medical literature, mostly on nutrition um, and how that relates to cardiovascular health. So I originally started off publishing a lot on medications, and then what ended up happening is I had a like a gym accident. I actually tore my pectoralis tendon when I was bench pressing by myself, and I no longer could eat whatever I wanted and just kind of work out and just you know burn the calories off and. So what I ended up having to do was I had to really dig into nutrition to figure out how I could sort of maintain an optimal weight and physique without being able to just, you know, bench press 300 pounds and, and, and burn off the sugars that I, that I was consuming probably, you know, up until, you know, my mid twenties, I was on a high carb diet. And so, um, what ended up happening is for sparking my interest in salt, I was working as a, um, a community pharmacist and I was having a bunch of patients coming up to me with um, dizziness and um, fatigue, exercise intolerance, really high heart rates, um, especially when they're going from a seated to a standing position. And they were all kind of placed on this low salt diet from their doctor because they had high blood pressure thinking it was the right thing to do. Um, they were basically like just telling me all I want to do is to be able to taste my food again. I just want to be able to salt my food, but it's supposedly this dietary demon, right? And so I would kind of push back and I would tell them, you know, you should let your doctor know that you're having these dizzy spells and severe salt cravings and maybe just get your salt levels checked. Um, you know, your serum sodium in the blood. And uh, I had a couple of patients come back really low and the doctor, you know, cut, cut down the diuretic or completely eliminated their diuretic or, and, and always told them to, you know, you know, start adding salt back because you have really low sodium levels in the blood. Um, and so that sparked my interest. I was like, you know, being an athlete, I was a wrestler and I ran cross country. I always knew that, you know, I never, my performance always suffered if I didn't make sure I was um, ingesting enough salt. So the low salt guidelines for everybody never made much sense. And, and that's really how, I started publishing about salt over the last five years, and then I spent about uh, two and a half, three years researching and writing the salt fix. Wow. Now, is that is the, the impact that salt has on your physical performance something that's well known amongst athletes? Because I'm not an athlete. That's not something that I am. That's not a, a concept that I'm familiar with. It used to be um, pretty well known uh, prior to the 1977 dietary goals before they demonized salt. Um, even the, the, the British soccer team, when they played Mexico for the World Cup in 1970 in Mexico, like sweltering heat, all their training sessions, they were put on slow-release sodium tabs, and they, during every game, they, all, all players, soccer players, got um, salt tabs. And it was like really well known back. You talk to anyone back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, it was really well known in, in the athletic performance that you, you take a salt tablet. And after we demonize salt, you're right. Virtually no one that I've talked to now in the athletic world really understands the benefits of salt. And that really was something very eye-opening in my research and really cool in the book. Probably one of the best takeaways in the book is how salt can improve athletic performance. That's incredible. So what happens when we eat salt? I mean, common, common knowledge, I think, you know, we have this idea that we consume salt, it goes into our blood, and that causes our blood to uh, dilute the sodium that's in the blood, and therefore blood pressure increases. Is that, you know, an overly simplified model of what happens? Yeah, I mean, basically, just like with, with dietary fat, right, how we oversimplified the LDL cholesterol leading to heart disease type of um, pathway, we oversimplified it with salt. We took one surrogate marker blood pressure, and we fell at the feet of it, 
And you're right. It was a very simple hypothesis that if you consume more salt, you are going to um, raise your sodium levels. You're going to activate thirst. You're going to drink more water to dilute those higher sodium levels. So that's going to raise blood volume and lead to high blood pressure. And basically, we based this uh, low salt guidelines on complete hypothesis. And it's just um, what ends up happening is it's just not true at all. Well, if we don't get enough salt, so many other harms outweigh any type of potential benefit. And in the book, I kind of show that even if you get a reduction in blood pressure, when you cut your salt intake, you're just volume depleting yourself hmm. and raising your heart rate. And it's kind of like you, people need to start thinking about low salt diets, like restricting their fluid intake. All you're doing is like telling someone basically to only consume like one cup of water. Just because you lower their blood pressure by doing that doesn't mean that's a healthy, you know, advisable thing to do. One of the case studies that you uh, documented in your book was a woman who presented to you showing symptoms that to me, because I'm very familiar, I do a lot of research on uh, diet and lifestyle and neurodegenerative disease. It sounded like she was almost eliciting symptoms of like a dementia with a movement disorder. She was having her gait changed and she was having cognitive difficulty. And this was all from, you know, she was on an SSRI, an antidepressant. And that was really shocking to me because, you know, one in 10 Americans, as I'm sure you know, is now on some kind of antidepressant. That number shoots up to one in four for women in their 40s and 50s. And so the idea that um, SSRIs can promote sodium depletion and that those symptoms can then look like or mimic something that might be misinterpreted as dementia, to me was really eye-opening. How might that happen? Yeah, what's really interesting is um, in order to bring vitamin C into the brain, it has to travel with sodium. And actually what ends up happening is if you have low sodium levels in the blood and you're eating a high-carb diet, because vitamin C can also be brought in by a uh, glucose transporter, but it'll compete with glucose. And so – when you have higher glucose levels, you kind of now are relying on sodium to bring in vitamin C into the brain. Hmm. And so there's actually studies showing that if you induce low sodium levels in animals, you can actually cause cognitive impairment and memory impairment. Wow. Like literally, they can't follow through the maze as well if they have normal sodium levels. And partly that's probably because there's that transporter that drives vitamin C into the brain. And vitamin C is very important for cognition. And sodium also brings vitamin C into the bone. Um, so there is you know, so many important benefits of salt that, that so few people even realize. Vitamin C is instrumental in uh, the synthesis of neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine. Yeah. So by limiting our sodium, we could essentially be sort of handicapping that, that machinery? A hundred percent, because in order to even absorb vitamin C as well and absorb it in the gastrointestinal tract, sodium pulls vitamin C wow. and biotin. It pulls a couple water-soluble vitamins. So it's definitely important that I kind of, you know, maintaining an, uh, your salt status is going to help obviously maintain your vitamin C status like we just discussed, but it also helps maintain magnesium and calcium as well. Hmm. So it's, it's kind of like maintaining that optimal balance so all the other minerals are in an optimal status as well. But how do, so how do people really get a sense of their blood sodium levels? I mean, I, as far as I know, sodium is a biomarker that's pretty, you know, it fluctuates day to day. Yep. You can have a different sodium reading from one minute to the next. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, absolutely correct. Um, and so basically... One of the ba I have a table of what are the signs, uh, potential signs of salt deficiency, and really it comes down to dehydration. Um, mm -hmm. On the lab, what what you'll see on a lab work is if you're consuming like adequate amounts of water, your blood urea nitrogen will be elevated. And what what does a doctor normally tell you when your BUN is elevated? They just tell you you're dehydrated. Well, most of the time it's probably actually salt deficiency. It's not that you're not consuming enough water, and Part of the reason why someone might not consume enough water is because they're not consuming enough salt. And salt helps activate our thirst as well. So it is also important in that aspect. But symptomatically, what you'll see is it's very common to have exercise intolerance and dizziness and increased heart rate, muscle spasms, muscle cramps when you're working out. That's a very um, important sign of salt deficiency. Literally overtraining syndrome is a salt depletion of the tissues because you're constantly sweating out salt and most athletes are never replacing back what they're losing. Right. And so you're, they're also getting those kind of workout headaches and because salt helps blood circulation. And so you can get massive headaches when you work out if you don't have enough salt. And yeah, go ahead. So not to cut you off. So would the BUN then be a better 
surrogate marker for your sodium levels and sodium in the same way that maybe like your blood glucose levels are not really a good show of your average levels. We rely more on like the hemoglobin A1C in that scenario. I mean, would you say the BUN is a, is a marker that people should sort of look out for? Yeah, no, that's a great, um, that's a great like comparison. And I do agree that, um, you can be deficient in salt absolutely and have completely normal sodium levels in the blood because oh. your body's fighting to maintain a normal sodium level. What will actually happen is if you go on a low salt diet and you're consumed, when I say a low salt diet, I mean like less than one teaspoon of salt, which mm. is less than 2,300 milligrams, the body will start pulling sodium from your bone to mm. maintain normal sodium levels. So you can have completely normal sodium levels and be severely deficient pulling sodium from your bone, but also magnesium and calcium. So keeping a good amount of uh, salt intake can help reduce magnesium and calcium being pulled from the bone and then wow. spit out the urine. So what are the sort of recommendations that you would make? I mean, obviously there's no, you know, I'm sure you'd agree there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all optimal diet. Should we all be eating a lot more salt? Are there people that shouldn't eat more salt? Are there people that should? I mean, one thing that uh, that you talk about is the fact that, you know, when we're on a low-carb diet, it causes our kidneys to excrete more sodium. So, I mean, should people on a lower-carb diet be going out of their way to eat more salt? Or, like, what is the sort of takeaway prescription? Yeah, no, it's a great, uh, great question. And really it comes down to an individual basis, mm -hmm. but I will say that 90% of American adults are consuming caffeine in some way or another. And caffeine is a huge salt waster out the urine. Mm. So if we consume just four cups of coffee per day, we can lose between a half a teaspoon to a full teaspoon of salt in just four hours in the urine. And the half-life of caffeine is like 5.2 hours. So in just four hours, you can lose an entire teaspoon of salt. Wow. So if everybody's consuming caffeine and we're losing an entire teaspoon of salt, why would we consume less than a teaspoon? It makes absolutely no sense. So if we're consuming caffeine, if we're on low-carb diets, which also you know encourage sodium depletion, if we're taking antidepressant drugs like SSRIs, which encourage sodium depletion, these are all things that might warrant uh, eating more salt. Yeah, and, and people exercising more. And people exercising more. Are there people that shouldn't eat more salt? People, I mean, would you would you say that people that have developed type 2 diabetes, people that have chronically high uh, blood sugar, chronically elevated insulin, I mean, should they be adding more salt to their diets as well? Yeah, so that might be the population that actually needs to be adding more salt is wow. the, the type 2 diabetics with high blood pressure because low salt diets can cause insulin resistance even worse. They can make you know your insulin resistance worse and elevate insulin levels more because that helps the kidneys retain more salt. So that's just what, the, what happens with the body. But also, when you cut your salt intake, the vasodilating properties of insulin, you also become resistant to that. The arteries actually become resistant mm -hmm. to the vasodilating properties of insulin. So literally, low salt diets can potentially cause hypertension and diabetes. And there was actually a study I mentioned in my book in that very population, type 2 diabetics with hypertension. And they compared three grams of sodium to six grams of sodium. And basically, the six grams of sodium fixed their insulin resistance. Hmm. So the very you know people we think should be avoiding salt may actually need to be consuming salt. And people that are told by their cardiologist to, to, to restrict salt, you would say that's something that, that patients should give pushback to their cardiologists? Yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, honestly, that's probably one of the worst uh, patient population to restrict salt intake again mm. for many reasons. And so one of them is that low salt diets increase heart rate. And obviously in someone who has coronary artery disease, that's the last thing you want to do is elevate their heart rate. And literally, I've seen studies where the heart rate goes up more than 25%. So mm. can you imagine like someone's heart rate going from like 60 beats per minute to 80 beats per minute? That's like an insane increase, like 20 beats per minute every single minute. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, the Lancet review published, um, I think it was May of 2016, where they found that people on very low sodium diets, below average intake, had increased risk of mortality. Yeah, no, I mean, among other things, is that it actually increased increases blood viscosity and mm. it activates platelets. Low salt diets have been shown in hypertensive patients to actually activate platelets and increase blood viscosity. And so when you add that in with an increase in heart rate, increased blood viscosity, and you activate all the stress hormones, noradrenaline and adrenaline, and you activate all the artery stiffening hormones, angiotensin II, renin and aldosterone, that is a metabolic storm for causing a clot, a heart attack, a stroke. Wow. 
Um, so I asked uh, some of my Facebook followers what questions they might have for you, and Melissa wanted to know, why am I always craving salt on a ketogenic diet? Yeah, I mean, this, hap this literally happened to me for more than just the initiation period. So what ends up happening when we cut our carbohydrate intake, when we initiate a ketogenic diet, is we go from having a chronically elevated level of insulin to a much lower amount of insulin. So the kidneys have relied upon insulin to reabsorb salt. So when you cut the carbs and drop the insulin, the kidneys start spilling salt. And what ends up happening is normally the first week, most people need about two grams of sodium per day in a extra in order to prevent what's being depleted and about one gram of sodium extra for the second week. But people with bad insulin resistance to start with, their kidneys have become so dependent on insulin that they could be spilling sodium for weeks on end. And you really got to match that with symptoms. And because I also am a big caffeine consumer, I chronically craved salt, felt dizzy during um, my ketogenic journey, and I had to make sure that I increased my salt intake chronically. So how do you do that? You just, just sprinkle some salt in your water, you throw more salt on your food. Like, What yeah. does that actually look like day-to-day -day for you? Yeah, so day-to-day. -day, so what you'll basically, if, if you were to kind of sit next to me or follow me for a day, what I would do, normally for breakfast I have two to three pastured eggs. And so what I like to do is I'll put um, Ancient Lakes magnesium flake salt. The flake salt's really good for my eggs. And it's cr the flake salt is honestly insanely high in magnesium. It's 180 milligrams of magnesium per 10 grams of salt. I mean, to give you a comparison, Himalayan salt only has 1.4 milligrams of magnesium per 10 wow. grams. So it's like astronomically different. What's the, what's the brand again? I'm going to put the link down below when I post this video. Yeah, it's it's Ancient Lakes Magnesium Infused Salt, cool. and they have two different salts. So there's a magnesium infused salt, which has 44 milligrams of magnesium per 10 grams of salt, but it has good amounts of iodine. And then there's their their special flake salt, and that's like at the, at the bottom of the, the magnesium brine, like the last um, kind of brine that they create to make these flake salts that are super saturated in magnesium, just insane amounts of magnesium. So I'll do that in the morning on my eggs. And then normally what I'll end up doing is for lunch, I'll probably um, consume like uh, like a bowl at Chipotle. Like I'll just do some, some vegetables, um, beans with it, um, corn, some meat, cheese, stuff like that. And then for dinner, normally what I'll do is I'll season um, some pork chops, put a nice layer of salt. So what a lot of people don't realize is salt is more than just flavor. If you create a coating that and you sear meat, you trap in all the juices and all the flavor. So that's like a really good benefit. And what I'll do is once I'm done cooking the pork chops, I'll kind of elevate the plate a little bit and let all those salty juices create a nice broth. And then I'll put like eight ounces of spinach in that salty broth. And I'll eat you know those bitter greens that I never would have without the salt. And so salt is your gateway to not only exercising more, but eating healthy, right? It'll, like my kids won't eat bitter greens or nuts or seeds without salt. And so it's like we're so afraid of salt that we'd rather have our kids eat low salt processed food when it's like just give them real food and add the salt to taste. And that's one of the major vehicles for salt in the American, the standard American diet is in processed foods. I mean, when people talk about, you know, the notion that Americans are eating a lot of salt, it's not in the form of these salt, you know, salt that we put on our foods that we season our foods with. It's in these ultra processed foods. Yeah, no, exactly. People aren't consuming salts from, you know, ancient oceans with high minerals and, you know, that don't have dextrose added to them and don't have anti-caking agents added to them and aren't bleached white. They're consuming and they're, like you said, 80% of um, you know, the salt intake in Americans is from processed foods. The top source of salt in the American diet is bread, which is actually kind of a interesting and counterintuitive. Yeah. And then they put like the salty deli meat, like with the phosphates and nitrates on top of the bread. Right. And it's just like this processed salt bomb, but you're not getting the good salt. Right. So now, so I was going to say, now that we're rethinking and reframing the way we view salt, that doesn't make those foods good for us suddenly. Correct. I mean, correct. those foods are still high in ultra refined, refined carbohydrates, very low in nutrient content, but we're saying that the salt content in them is perhaps not the uh, dietary demon that we once thought it was. Exactly. So Rachel from my Facebook uh, fan page asks, and you kind of already talked about this, but with all the different brand names and different types of salts such as sea salt, gray, pink, or Himalayan salt, which do you recommend 
as the healthiest option. Prices vary widely. So yeah, how do you, you know, what do you tell your average consumer who's uh, intimidated by all the options in the, you know, supermarket? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question. If you go into like my kitchen cabinet, what you're going to find is two salts. One is Redmond Real Salt, and the other is the Ancient Lakes Magnesium Infused Salt or their Flake Salt. That's pretty much all I use. And the reason is, is because they're one of the only salts from an ancient ocean. And people, like I was blown away, like the nuances and uh, of salt. But basically, if you get like Celtic sea salt or so sea salt from a modern day ocean, you actually get the pollution in the salt. So there's going to be microplastics, potentially heavy metals and other contaminants. When you actually get your salt from an ancient ocean that was formed millions of years ago, you're not going to have that issue. And so literally salts from modern day oceans have been tested with, you know, high, pretty high levels of microplastics. So it is a real, it's, it's a real documented measured thing. And what I'll do, what if I'm working out more than an hour a day, I'll probably use Redmond because you sweat out a lot of iodine and Redmond real salt has about 170 micrograms of iodine per 10 grams of salt. Hmm. And we sweat up to a hundred micrograms of iodine per hour of exercise. Um, if I am going to be working out an hour or less, I'll probably use Ancient Lakes magnesium salt because it still has good amounts of iodine. It's going to give me uh, 10 grams of their salt has 121 micrograms of iodine. So it'll kind of cover that one hour of exercise for my iodine loss. But if I go above that, then I'll probably grab Redmond. It's great to know. Um, I actually also use Redmond uh, real salt. It's great. And I have a salt lamp as well. I don't know if this benefits me in any way other than just looking cool but so what other things should people uh know i mean are there symptoms that people should look out for you know maybe if they're not eating enough salt there's some you know subjective sensation that they might be able to recognize standing up from a seated position and feeling a bit sort of lightheaded is that uh yeah. normal or is that something that you know might indicate that you're not eating enough salt for example. Yeah. So what happens when you go from a seated to a rising position and you're dizzy is you're just not getting good blood circulation to the brain. And so adding salt can actually treat that extremely quickly. And so I've had a few people with POTS and it's very common. There's, there's over 3 million people in the U S with it more common in females, but POTS is basically that postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, where when you go from a seated to a standing position, you get an over 30 beat per minute increase in heart rate. And I've had people tell me that if they drink pickle juice right away, it, it kind of like cuts that rapid heart rate out right away. Hmm. And so that's how quick salt can actually fix, um, you know, that type of symptom in people who have POTS. Another symptom like we talked about is exercise intolerance over training syndrome where their joints are hurting and they're becoming slowly depleted in salt is another big uh, symptom, but just salt cravings. Your body has a built in safety mechanism to try to prevent you from dying of salt deficiency. And one of them is actually activating the reward system. So when you, so you get more cravings for salt and when you actually get salt in the diet, you'll consume more of it. The problem is, is sugar can hijack that activated reward system when we're on low salt diets. And so low salt, diets can potentially lead you sugar and drug addiction because it activates the reward center in the brain. And so people craving sugar may actually be a sign of salt deficiency because they're not only craving it more potentially because the brain's reward system is activated for it, but they're more insulin resistant on the low salt diet. And when you're more insulin resistant and you have elevated levels of insulin, your body can't kind of grab those stored fat stores. So it craves more dietary carbohydrates. So what are some things that people should not be eating more of uh, in their diets? You mentioned sugar. I'm assuming yeah. sugar is on the uh, do not eat list of the uh, in the salt fix. Is that accurate? Yeah, no. I mean, that's the bad white crystal, right? There's right. like there's like the giveaway, right? Salt's good, sugar's bad. Um, but yeah, no. Like obviously, um, industrially processed omega six vegetable oils are probably very bad for the health. There's good studies. I published a review paper in BMJ Open Heart how. You know, those uh, those industrial seed oils th that are high in omega-6 have been shown to potentially increase coronary heart disease mortality, cardiovascular events, and all-cause mortality compared to saturated fat. So we can pretty much say with um, a pretty resounding yes that they're probably more harmful than saturated fat. Um, whether saturated fat is bad, I honestly don't really believe so. That I don't believe that saturated fat per se is bad. Um, 
I do think some people can over consume red meat, um, but I do think women are under consuming red meat um, because the body's not very efficient at getting rid of iron stores if you're a man and the iron requirements for a man are more, uh, they're less than half that of a woman who hasn't gone through um, menopause yet. So I think a lot of women are actually iron deficient and not eating enough red meat. Very um, interesting. And you would yeah. say that men pr likely eat too much meat? Is that did I did I, I catch think, that? I think if if you are a man and you're and you're consuming more than a pound and a half of meat, you're probably slowly accumulating iron. Very interesting. Wow, these are all great uh, great tips. Any other takeaways? We've covered so much ground. Yeah, no, I think there's a bunch of disease states that can precipitate salt deficiency. So. I counsel patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis on a daily basis, and they don't absorb salt very well and bec can become depleted in salt extremely quickly. And same with patients with celiac disease and even people with uh, uh, IBS, they don't absorb salt well. And so there are, so there's that group of population and, and there's millions of people who've had um, their colon removed or part of their um, ileum removed and they don't absorb salt well. I have a few family members. Um, that have actually been placed on a low salt diet and wound up in the hospital be, with severe dehydration and low sodium levels in the blood. And one of them didn't absorb salt well because they had their colon removed. And literally your colon helps you absorb salt. And there's also a bunch of disease states, um, kidney damage to the kidneys where your kidneys can no longer retain your salty blood basically, right? Mm -hmm. Like your, your kidneys have to filter three and a half pounds of salt every single day and they have to actively reabsorb all that salt. And if they can't reabsorb it and it's spilling, you can literally die of salt deficiency like within minutes. Um, and sugar, consuming a diet high in sugar for, for years can actually damage the kidneys to, and lead you to become a salt uh, waster. Wow. Is there an upper tolerable limit on salt intake? I mean, is there, you know, we don't want people to or do we want people to watch this video and then go pound five tablespoons of salt? Yeah, um, that's such a great question. Honestly, I'm so glad you asked it because for the last 10,000 years, we've consumed an extremely high salt diet because we didn't have refrigerators to preserve our food. So we literally salted everything. So in the 1600s in Sweden, the average intake of salt per person was 100 grams, which is over 10 times what we consume today. Um, in the 1500s in Europe, they consumed 40 grams of salt, and in the 1700s, they consumed 70 grams of salt. There was no real chronic disease back then, right? And so the kidneys can absolutely tolerate, if you have normal kidneys, um, at least uh, 90 to 100 grams of salt per day. And wow. if you look at some of the longest living populations, Japan, South Korea, they all eat a high salt diet. So, I mean, we have good evidence that if you eat a high salt diet, you potentially can live longer. So I, I don't know of any good evidence that would ever say that someone would want to cut your salt intake. Wow. Well, thank you so much. This has been uh, enlightening. I can't wait to share. I can't wait to share this with the world. Spread the word. Um, where can people find out more about you and your work? And if they want to follow you on social media, what are your uh, social media handles? Yeah, people can follow me on uh, Twitter at Dr. James Dinick, D-I-N-I-C. They can follow me um, uh, on my Facebook. So I have my personal page and then I have my professional page, which is Dr. James Dinick Antonio. And I'm also on Instagram. And people can check out my website, thesaltfix.com, um, where they can learn more about the book. When where's the book available? Yeah, the book's available nationwide at Barnes & Noble. Um, people can order it online at Target and online at Walmart. Um, it's also available, obviously, on Amazon and, and things like that. Dude, awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me, Max.